Good morning, everyone. My name is Sue. On behalf of the Goochland branch of the Pamunkey Regional Library, welcome to today's program, The Garden of Eden. This presentation is part of the 2022 Horticultural Series developed in a partnership between the library and the Goochland Powhatan Master Gardener Association. Representing the Master Gardeners today, we have Audrey Hirsch, who is a Goochland Powhatan Master Gardener Association volunteer, and today's presenter, Kathy McCarthy, who is also a volunteer. Originally from Delaware, Kathy settled in the Richmond area after completing graduate studies at the University of Virginia and began learning the joys of gardening in clay soil. Her newspaper articles and speaking engagements typically focus on sustainable gardening topics. Today, her topic is about Virginia's influence on horticulture around the globe in the 18th century and the fun of including historical plants in your own modern, modern garden. Let's get started. The chat feature is available, so please send up your questions. They will be addressed at various points throughout the presentation. Here is Kathy McCarthy with the Garden of Eden. All right, thank you so much, Susan. Welcome everybody. Uh, it, we were just discussing, it's a beautiful morning in November and nice time to talk about gardening. Um, this particular topic um, is a mix between history and horticulture. And I got interested in this topic. I think it's a, a different way to think about native plants and hopefully, um, at the end of the discussion, we all value native plants in a slightly different way. Um, so um, welcome to the Garden of Eden uh, and our discussion of how Virginia horticulture really influenced the world in the 18th century. And as Susan discussed, um, any questions that you have, I um, will keep rolling, uh, but I do every you know, eight or nine slides, I have a, a pause built in, at which point Audrey will direct me on any type of questions or discussion points or anything you want to add to the discussion. I know many times people have their own um, expertise that they want to add to the discussion, and I'm very open to that as well. So um, let's get started. So as uh, Susan discussed, um, Audrey and myself and probably several people on the line are part of the Master Gardener Association. It's a volunteer organization. This is our plug. So the first two slides are the, uh, the, the plugs. <laughs> um, but we're always looking for volunteers and you don't have to be any particular type of gardener or really even have a gardening background to become a Master Gardener volunteer. So I encourage everybody to uh, check out the program. Uh, we do training once a year, um, usually starts in January. Uh, we just finished, I think, the application process for this year. Um, but if you are someone who would be interested in becoming a Master Gardener, um, please go to gpmga.org and um, check it out because we would love to welcome you into next year's training class if you're interested. Um, the second plug and the final one uh, is our next upcoming really large event in Goochland County um, is Spring Garden Fest. We do this every year. This is the 17th annual Garden Fest. It's free. Uh, we usually get six or 700 folks to come out. It's on the grounds of the Reynolds Community College right off Dickinson Road. Um, and everything about it is free. So you're welcome to come and check it out. Uh, there's a large plant sale that the Master Gardeners put in. Also the students at Reynolds Community College grow beautiful plants and sell them at Spring Garden Fest. There's music and some food trucks and just a good time, some gardening vendors. If you're interested in classes, um, specifically there are a bunch of classes that are offered. Um, that registration process will begin January 5th also on gpmga.org. Uh, so look out for that if you're interested in attending classes. Otherwise, just come out and have a good time um, and get some food. <laughs> okay, so into today's actual discussion. Uh, this is an outline of the presentation. I always like to be a little mysterious with my outlines. So um, we'll talk a little bit about why binomial nomenclature allows for world peace. 
Uh, we'll talk about uh, a name mystery. Um, this will be a history mystery. And then we'll get into some of the research uh, that I did and what we learned, what I learned about uh, 18th century horticulture in Virginia. And then finally, we'll get into the plants. So if you're a plant nerd instead of a history nerd, the plant part will be the second half. Uh, and we'll talk about some fun plants that you can grow uh, in your gardens. So how does binomial nomenclature allow for world peace, right? So uh, binomial nomenclature is the Latin naming system of plants. Many of you on the uh, webinar probably already know a lot about Linnaeus and the fact that in 1742, he came up with the system, right? So people were naming plants kind of in a willy-nilly manner. Uh, there were many competing systems, kind of like uh, DVDs versus Blu-rays, for those of you who are old enough to remember that, <laughs> um, and eventually DVDs won. And in the binomial nomenclature uh, contest, Linnaeus won. His system became most prominent, and so we have uh, a two-word way of naming plants. We have the genus is the first word, and the specific epithet um, or species name is the second word. And I hate pronouncing Latin names. It's not my favorite, <laughs> but I recognize the value of it because common names are very confusing. Um, my, the example that I always give is my mother-in-law lives in South Carolina. Whenever we go to visit her, she'll give me a little pot of something. And she always tells me the name. Um, and then I come home and she'll say, oh, this is walking stick. And I'll come home and I'll type it into Google. And walking stick is an exotic plant from South Africa or whatever the case may be. And I'm looking at my little pot and I'm thinking, that is not what she just gave me. Um, so I never know what to do with the plants that she gives me. The common names never match up. Um, and I just stick them in the ground and hope that they make it. Um, so the, you know, so binomial nomenclature allows you to really understand what type of plant you're looking at. And in this particular instance, we're looking at a picture of um, Mount Stewart. It's in County Down, Ireland. And this talk got kind of kicked off because I was researching plants in the National Trust Gardens in Great Britain. One day I'm going to go on a tour in Great Britain. I'm going to go on one of these fabulous tours of all these National Trust Gardens because they all look so beautiful. Look at that picture. And I knew that as I was researching the plants in these gardens for my one day trip, um, that common British names were not going to match up to US British names. If I can't match up to the common names that my mother-in-law in South Carolina <laughs> gives me, uh, certainly not gonna match up with these British names, right? So I started looking up the uh, botanical names um, the, the Latin name, so that I would know what types of plants I was looking at, because um, I knew the common names weren't going to work. And so when I looked at, at the beginning plant list, these were some of the common names that were on there, and there was some overlap with Virginia common names, and I kind of expected that because I knew that um, these beautiful National Trust Gardens that give these, uh, you know, you can go on these very expensive tours, I understood that about 50% of the plants in these gardens are actually American natives. So we tend to bring in all these plants from Asia and other places, and the British uh, tend to look at our plants, our native plants, as phenomenal plants for gardens. And so I knew that there was uh, going to be some overlap. But it was interesting as I pulled up the uh, botanical names, the Latin names, there was something that was repeated and very striking for me. Um, and again, I probably should have said, or actually Susan said at the beginning, I grew up in Delaware. And so as I looked at all these plant names, I knew that the specific epithet, um, the second part of the name, often will talk about either the person who discovered the plant or some aspect of the plant, you know, rubra for red plant, or where the plant was discovered. Um, and here, as you look at all these plant names, I'm sure you can see uh, Virginia is <laughs> very common here, right? So repeated over and over again. 
So I'll just flip back to the common names. Um, bluebells and fringe tree and sweet bay and mountain mint. Um, but then when you look at the botanical names again, these plants are all named after Virginia. And one of the things that struck me was these plants are actually native, many of these plants are native up and down the East Coast, um, you know, from Massachusetts to Georgia sometimes. And especially some of these plants like live oaks um, are actually much more common south of us, right? And yet live oak is Quercus virginiana. It's named after Virginia. Um, and Eastern red cedars, Juniperus virginiana, also super native and common uh, all up and down the East Coast. So why weren't these plants, um, you know, why isn't it Juniperus Massachusetts or Pennsylvania? Or why are these all named after Virginia? Because they're, they're not just native here. Um, and I started getting curious. Um, so I always start when I research something, I start with, can I find a simple explanation? Can I research this in about two minutes and come up with a simple explanation? And uh, this quote is from <laughs> taking my child to the pediatrician. Uh, and we, we first, I took my son in and the first pediatrician through the door was the intern. And my child had a fever and a cough. And by the time the intern got done, I was concerned I needed to take my child to the hospital. I mean, it sounded terrible, right? The intern was like, oh, this could be anything, you know, you've got a cough and a fever, it could be something really complicated. And I was concerned. And then the 30-year veteran pediatrician came in and said, son, <laughs> the intern was a gentleman, son, you should follow the KISS principle. If you are standing on a farm in Central Virginia and you hear hoofbeats coming over a hilltop, please don't assume you are about to see a zebra. <laughs> so it was just a really great encapsulation of start with something simple, right? Oftentimes the explanation is pretty simple. And it turned out, you know, my son had a cold, right? I think maybe we left with some penicillin. It just wasn't that complicated. So when I started researching all these Virginia plant names, I also tried to start with a simple theory. And so my theory, my first theory was Virginia was a very, very populated uh, colony, right? So maybe it was just a matter of quantity and that's why these plants weren't named after Massachusetts or Pennsylvania. Um, because, I mean, you look and Virginia was the most populous uh, colony in 1750, right? And Linnaeus is launching his naming system in 1742. So that kind of fits, right? Um, that could be the case. Um, however, you know, you just dig one more layer down and it turns out that Virginia at the time, um, a lot of the population in Virginia was actually people who were enslaved, right? So 44% of the population of Virginia was enslaved in 1750 versus in Massachusetts, it was 2% of the population um, as well as Pennsylvania, it was only 2% of the population was enslaved. So, you know, typically an enslaved person wasn't allowed to be a botanist. Um, you, you can go back and look at the records from places like Monticello or Mount Vernon and enslaved people were absolutely fantastic um, as gardeners and were actually very, very skilled horticulturalists, uh, but they weren't typically allowed to communicate uh, with folks like Linnaeus in, in uh, Sweden. So that the quantity or the population number theory didn't really explain it um, because it in that case, most of these plants should have been named after Massachusetts. So that took me to simple theory number two, right? So it still could be something simple. And so maybe it was, if it wasn't quantity, maybe it was quality, maybe the most famous um, botanists of the time were from Virginia. Maybe that's uh, what happened and why they were named after Virginia. But it, it turns out, <laughs> 
that if you look at that time period, really the most famous botanists were in Pennsylvania. So John Bartram, uh, the father, and William Bartram, the son, uh, were the most well-known here in the United States, and or well, at that point in time, the colonies, um, as well as in Europe. John Bartram was appointed the Royal Botanist in 1765, but even before that, uh, he had a nursery catalog, he had a nursery in outside Philadelphia. Uh, the Constitutional Congress, uh, when Jefferson and Washington got tired of creating our constitution, they actually went to the Bartram nursery to kind of revive themselves. Um, they took a carriage ride out there. So he, he was very famous, very well known, um, as well as his son was very well known and uh, wrote several books about botany in the colonies. So it wasn't quality, uh, that wasn't the answer. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about what is the answer in a second, but just in case anybody had any questions about the first part, kind of the mystery itself, uh, I wanted to take a quick pause. So Audrey, no questions so far, so. Okay. Go right I along. Just started. Okay, good. I like to build in pauses because otherwise I'll keep rolling. We'll be at this. <laughs> I'll get excited and we'll never talk. Uh, okay, so, so we have this mystery, right? It's not quantity of people, it's not quality of botanists. So, why were all these plants named after Virginia? Uh, again, even though they're native across a wide swath. And so as I got into the research, so my undergraduate degree is in history. So I, I get into primary source research, I like it. <laughs> and so I started digging in and really what I identified is there's kind of a three part perfect storm of why Virginia becomes so prominent uh, in 18th century horticulture. And I like alliteration. So I went with plight of the military, prophets, and plant hunters sent by God, right? So a little Blues Brother reference there. Got to make, you know, got to make botany interesting. Um, so let's dig into each of these and kind of understand how they're connected and, and, and how we end up with these plant names. So the first start is, the first point is the plight of the military, right? So I always think of Britain as kind of this very staid, um, sort of comfortable place that has always been at peace. But that wasn't really true at the time that these plants were being named. Uh, so if you look at this chart, this is 300 years, more than 300 years of war in England. Um, and so you start with the Hundred Years' War in the 1300s, you know, the War of the Roses, the Eighty Years' War, all the way up to the Nine Years' War. Uh, I usually joke around that they had so many wars, they just named them after the length of time. They couldn't, they couldn't come up with more interesting names because there were so many wars. Um, but then you have the War of the Spanish Succession. And so basically from 1337 to 1714, you have England at war, right? And that's a long time to have this tumultuous, um, you know, process going on. And then you think about what is England, right? So England is an island. So if you're at war, naval power is vital. And in the 18th century, if you're gonna be a naval power, you need mass, right? And mass require very large trees. Um, old trees. And what's happened throughout this whole process is England has, you know, been harvesting all of their large trees for ships so that they can go to war. And you have deforestation. So at this point in the mid 18th century, England is dependent on Norway and Russia for mast sized trees, uh, which is not good right? You don't really want to depend on Catherine the Great or someone that you would go to war with to provide the central item that makes your ships go. Um, we wouldn't want to be dependent on, on another country for tanks and airplanes at this point in time, right? So what happens is people get interested in uh, something that was brought over to England in the mid-17th century, and that is 
trees that John Tredeskin, John Tredeskin was one of the gardeners to King Charles I and his son, or well, that's the younger. Um, the older was the gardener to King Charles I. John Tredeskin, the younger, was a gardener to King Charles II. And he was sent in the 1640s and again in the 1650s to the colonies to develop, to take plant samples and bring them back for the king. Well, at this point, now uh, by 1686, a lot of his tree samples, he brought back, um, I'll read from a list so I won't skip any. He brought back tulip poplars, red maples, black walnuts, black locusts, and multiple types of oaks uh, from the Virginia colony. He brought those back for the king. But now it's 1686, many of those specimens were mature, right? So they're 40 years old and they're, they're starting to look really good as maps. <laughs> so at that point in time, John Evelyn, who was one of the founders of the Royal Society, writes to the Admiralty and says, I want you to use military ships to bring back trees uh, from the Virginia colony. And sweet gum, sassafras, persimmons, cedar of Virginia, we think is Eastern red cedar. Um, and it seems like a small thing. So he told the military to bring back trees. But what happens is transportation in the, that time in the 18th century, late uh, 17th century, was extremely expensive. And transporting plants require, at that point in time, required things like removing the captain from the captain's cabin. So all the pots could go into the captain's cabin and be kept warm, right? And you needed to make sure that they weren't, the seawater wasn't getting to them. And so you know, these days we think it's extremely expensive to order plants from bluestone perennials, right? So every time I order plants online, I'm like, the plants cost $30 and the shipping costs $35. You know, you just think, oh gosh, I can't stand to pay for the shipping. Um, and in the 18th century, it was even more difficult, right? You just couldn't transport plants in any way that you wanted to, and by ship was many months, it was very expensive. So having a military onus, right, saying this is a military purpose, all of a sudden gets you the ability to ship a lot more plants than you would normally be able to. So the analogy that I use is uh, SpaceX, when they have a military payload, you know, that gets put, those satellites get put out into space much more quickly uh, than a private satellite because you get put to the top of the priority list. So here they're told that these plants have military priority and therefore they get put to the top of the list. They get shipped back to England at a time when they might not have been able to, uh, you know, have that transportation if they weren't a priority uh, for the military. So that's the first P. The second P, uh, profits, right? So if you look up and down the East Coast of the uh, of North America, um, which would eventually become the United States, many of the colonies are religious, right? They were set up for religious dissidents. So you have Puritans in Massachusetts, you have Quakers in Pennsylvania, you have the Huguenots, the French Huguenots in New York. Virginia, not for religious dissidents. <laughs> Virginia was set up by the Virginia Company to make money. Um, that was the purpose of the colony and that's why it was funded and that's why people uh, were sent here to be colonists. So as early as 1588, you have a whole marketing scheme going into um, making sure that the Virginia colony is profitable. Uh, I love, I do marketing for a living. So I always, I love marketing copy, even from 1588. Um, so it says, our purpose is to give our readers a general idea of what the country is and how you can profit from supporting it. <laughs> so they didn't say it was beautiful or it was a nice place to live. They just said you can make money. Um, so the Virginia company is chartered in 1606. And um, they 
began looking at all sorts of different revenue streams from the Virginia colony. And one of the key revenue streams had to do with horticulture, right? So again, great marketing copy. I'm going to read it because I just, I know you can read. <laughs> so I'm just going to read it out loud because I think it's really hard selling. Um, it is said of New England that several plants will not grow there, but I don't know of any plant, grain or fruit, that miscarries in Virginia, but most of them better their kinds very much by being sowed or planted there. So I don't know if we as gardeners would agree that <laughs> every plant, no matter what, does well in Virginia clay soils, but uh, according to Robert Beverly, no matter what plant you planted, it was going to do well in Virginia unlike, you know, New England. Um, so you have this, you have a supportive Navy, right, which in uh, 1680s, 90s, around the turn of the 18th century, is bringing these trees over to England. They're growing up. Um, so 40 years later, in the mid 18th century, you have these you know, beautiful plants that are now maturing in England, and people can see them. And then you have a profit-focused profit colony, which wants to create revenue streams from anything that's available. And so now you have a combination, right? So you have visible evidence in England of beautiful plants. You have people who wanna make money um, off the Virginia colony. And that kind of takes us to our third P, um, and our Blues Brothers reference here, plant hunters sent by God, right? So finally in the 18th century, England is settling down, right? So the War of Spanish Succession ends in 1714 and things start to settle and peace brings prosperity. And you now have a pretty wealthy class of folks in England that are looking for hobbies uh, and they have money to spend on them. And so this illustration, I sang Yankee Doodle Dandy my whole life, and I never put the connection <laughs> that a macaroni is actually a hipster. So there you go. So this is a botanic macaroni. This is, uh, you can see he's got one long pant leg, he's got one short pant leg. Um, but when a macaroni puts a feather in his cap, it's actually a hipster. Um, putting a feather in his cap. So in the 18th century, it was very hip to collect plants and it was a sign of wealth. Um, and so you had botanic macaronis. Um, so anyway, I thought it was a fun, fun thing, right? Um, so this gentleman here is collecting plants. You can see he's looking at an illustration of a plant and Throughout England, wealthy folks were beginning to uh, develop this hobby, right? So if you look out your window in Virginia, uh, you're probably going to see a tulip tree, right? They're super common here. Um, and in this time though, if you wanted one in England, you would spend $16,000 in today's dollars to uh, purchase a tulip tree and have it uh, shipped to you in England. But people were doing it, it was super popular. And then England for the first time is beginning to see fall color. So again, John Evelyn, the Navy had brought these trees over several types of oaks um, and maples and the, the trees that I listed before. And so now in the mid 17th century, these are mature trees. And what I didn't realize is there weren't a lot of native trees in England that produced fall color, but these plants from the Americas did. And so even common people, I mean, clearly you had to be very wealthy to spend $16,000 on a tree, <laughs> but even common people are beginning to see colored leaves and these mature trees on the grand states kind of turning colors. So there was a lot of interest in uh, plants from North America and exotic is in. Um, I, this doesn't really have a lot to do with plants, but I threw it in here as an example of the exotic um, because I just enjoy it. So William Byrd II, uh, if you've been to any of the plantations on Route 5 uh, east of Richmond, you, you've heard of William Byrd and the Byrd family. 
Um, he travels to England and he gives a presentation to the Royal Society on the charms of female possums as pets. <laughs> so there you go. You didn't know that the possum that you see crossing the road or out behind your house was actually an exotic pet in the 18th century. So this is, that's kind of the context, right? Uh, the context for 18th century England. And if you look at Henry Compton uh, as the Bishop of London, he has enormous power, right? He's the son of the Earl of Northampton. He actually um, crowned William and Mary. Um, and he is a member of the Royal Society and he decides who goes to the Virginia colony as a minister, right? He controls all of the uh, placement of clergymen in the Church of England for the Virginia colony. And he is part of this botanic macaroni group, right? So he picks John Bannister, who is one of the few ordained ministers who is also a botanist uh, as his lead clergyman to send to England. And he tells him to, uh, this is my favorite quote, he's an Oxford trained botanist and Henry Compton, the Bishop of London tells him to save souls and observe flora. <laughs> so he sends him, you know, abstainably to be a minister in the Virginia colony, but he also tells him to send him back a lot of plants. So Bannister collects over 300 specimens uh, live specimens, dried and seeds. He sends them back um, to England. Unfortunately, he's on a hunting trip with William Byrd the first, and he actually gets killed in the Virginia colony. But he sends back his collection, and it arrives in Oxford and gets cataloged in Oxford. At the same time, Carl Linnaeus, who came up with the botanical system, travels to England to basically it's a fundraising trip. So he, he knows that his botanical system is competing with several other botanical systems that are currently being promoted. Um, and he really wants his botanical system to win. And he knows that England is very wealthy. It's full of people who like to collect exotic plants, uh, the Royal Society and the members of the Royal Society kind of compete on the plants that they collect. And so he travels to England on a fundraising trip. He hopes to get those individuals to invest in his botanical system and support his botanical system. And, you know, it would kind of be like getting the Kardashians to post you on social media these days, right? You get the support of all these influencers on your botanical system and you're going to win. So he travels to England. He goes to Oxford. Bannister's collection is now sitting at Oxford. And he says that he will, um, he dedicates a book to the librarian at Oxford who manages this botanical collection. Um, and he starts naming things after Virginia, um, which again, a lot of these uh, Royal Society members have invested in the Virginia company. So, you know, they wanna get a return on their investment. So he's, he's sort of humoring them and supporting them by naming things after their colony. Um, and, at the same time, John Clayton, who uh, lives sort of near Williamsburg, is publishing, he works with Grenovius, who is a colleague of Linnaeus, to publish The Flora Virginica. So all of these things kind of come together so that in 1742, when he publishes, when Linnaeus publishes his botanical system, a lot of the plants, um, common plants are named after Virginia. So it's a three-part perfect storm, right? You had the plight of the military, you had a profit-seeking colony, and you had, uh, you know, plant hunters that were sent by the Church of England to go and gather up material, and you end up with a really wonderful uh, dedication to the colony of Virginia, now the state of Virginia, 
um, with great plants that we use all the time in our gardens and are actually even uh, more highly esteemed in England in these royal uh, gardens and the um, Royal Trust gardens. Uh, here named after our home state. So um, that's how you get here. So that's kind of the um, first part of the discussion, right, of the history of how we got to these plants. The second part of the discussion is going to kind of pivot to how we use these plants in our uh, modern day gardens. So if anybody has any questions about the historical part of the presentation, Now's your time. I don't see or, any questions, but uh, oh, is there oh, is go there ahead. one? Or comments. I'm very open to if anybody has um, something from their expertise or experience that they want to offer up. Don't hear anything, but I do have a thought that um, I know that King Charles in England is very interested in botany. And yeah. gardening, and I'm one. I think he would love this presentation personally. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. There's um, he published a book. Um, it's so funny calling him King Charles. I kind of have to get used to that. Um, I guess he's King Charles the third, um, since the first and second were in the 17th century. But um, he published a book on his estate, uh, which is not part of the Royal Trust. Um, but, or the National Trust, but I think you can go and visit it. I'll have to look that up. But anyway, he published a book on Highgrove, his estate. And he, yes, and not only is his son, you know, supporting the Earthshot Prize, also around sustainability in our planet, but King Charles for 25 years, I mean, way before it was popular, was all about sustainability and sustainable gardening practices. So um, that's an interesting connection. Um, you're always thinking, Audrey. Um, all right, anybody, feel free to type it in the chat box. I know when I get rolling, I'm going at top speed, so. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're gonna kind of pivot. We know about all these uh, fantastic plants, um, Eastern North America native plants that have been named after Virginia. And I think one of the cool things that we can do is we can put a bit of that history in our garden. And these are great plants. Um, most of you clearly know that native plants are very, uh, typically very low maintenance because again, they co-evolved with our ecology here in, uh, I think it's called the Eastern Ecotype. I also just call it Virginia. <laughs> so they co-evolved here, right? And so they were the plants that were successful in our soil, successful with our weather, although that's changing slightly, um, successful with our rainfall amount and our temperatures. And so they're pretty happy here. And so that makes them uh, typically more low maintenance. They're also very functional plants, right? So again, that coevolution means that the bugs that live here, the insects um, can use them to reproduce. Uh, a lot of times they're obligate. So they were built to you know, use these plants for their young. Um, they also are typically pretty functional for birds, so they'll produce high fat berries in the uh, fall when migrating birds need high fat berries. They'll produce blooms in the spring when birds need caterpillars to feed their young. They're just, they're built to really be functional uh, in our ecosystem, which is wonderful. Um, and then I always have to say, and they're really beautiful. <laughs> so one of the reasons why they became such popular ornamental plants in the National Trust Gardens, right? You can pay like $8,000 to go on a tour of the National Trust Gardens and 50% of the plants will be Virginia natives. <laughs> You'll think, wow, I paid a lot of money to go see native plants. But they, they esteem these plants so much and they, and they appreciate these plants so much because they're just beautiful. Um, 
So one thing I do like to say before I get started on native plants is there's a lot of different definitions of what's native. Um, typically, I look at native plants as something that uh, was here before Western migration. So plants that our Native American communities uh, would have been familiar with, but prior to uh, Western migration or Western Europe migration uh, here. And so this is a terrific uh, website. It's on the references page. Um, so Susan was great and she linked the references page right there on the Guchelin calendar, Guchelin library calendar. But this is vaplantatlas.org. And so if your definition of native, if you want the plant to be native specifically to your county um, and not just Virginia, or if you wanna know where it's native, inside of Virginia, you can go to this website um, and you just type in the plant and it will show you these little red dots, show you the specific counties where the plant is native. So it's just a cool website, you know, if you want to, um, you know, kind of geek out and know exactly where these plants are native. So that's on the reference sheet, but it's vaplantatlas.org. And sometimes you just go type in a bunch of plants. <laughs> so that plant, the example plant, Mertensia virginica, um, also more commonly known as Virginia bluebells, is our first up Virginia plant. Um, and you can plant all these in your, in your garden. You can name your garden a very Virginia garden. Uh, it would be great. But I'm just going to highlight some that I think are terrific. So Virginia bluebells, um, this is it blooms very early, right? So late March, early April, depending on where you have it planted. Uh, that is fantastic for queen bumblebees. So, you know, the queen bumblebee overwinters, uh, she comes out of her uh, nest very early. There's not a lot of things in bloom and she needs pollen and nectar to be able to set up uh, her nest for the coming season. So it's always nice to have something that blooms early uh, for that particular pollinator. And Virginia bluebells does it. Um, they are gorgeous. <laughs> so I, I was running in Central Park in New York uh, several years ago and I came around a corner and there was a whole patch of these Virginia bluebells. And I just stopped, not only because I couldn't breathe, because <laughs> I've been running way too hard, but also because it, it kind of took my breath away. I mean, they're, they're stunning. Um, I have a lot of black walnuts in my garden, uh, which I don't recommend because of the juglone and the toxicity. Um, they will kill anything around them, but Virginia bluebells um, are tolerant of black walnuts. So if you were like me, uh, you could plant these under a black walnut. And uh, they like a shady position, um, but you know, they're, they're pretty tolerant of different conditions. They are a spring ephemeral. So those of you who, um, you know, have gardened with spring ephemerals before, you know that they look gorgeous and then they completely disappear. So I actually see that as an advantage because what you can do is you can kind of plant around them. They'll come up, they'll bloom, they'll look beautiful. The foliage and everything will disappear. And then you can have a successive plant after them kind of taking up that same space. So you kind of get two for one, uh, but just something to keep in mind. And their history is they were, we know that they were grown in England as early as 1700. Um, and both John Custis, who was a famous gardener in Williamsburg uh, in the 1730s and Jefferson at Monticello in the 1760s talk about growing Virginia bluebells. So it's got a long history of being an ornamental plant. Next one up, Virginia Sweet Spire. Uh, this is a great one, easy to care for. Um, I actually like it for a strange reason. <laughs> I like it for fall color. Um, it has, I don't have any pictures of that, of course, uh, but anyway, you can look it up online. <laughs> um, it has beautiful fall colors, uh, like reds and oranges, and, um, you know, burning bush is a bleh, terrible invasive plant, but takes over ecosystems, it's not good. Um, and if you're trying to 
you know, pull those out and replace them. You could think about something, there's a variety called um, Henry's Garnet uh, of uh, Sweet Spire that has absolutely beautiful red foliage. And even the, um, the straight up species, I think has nice fall color. Um, so just uh, something, like, oh, somebody needs to be admitted. You got that? Okay. <laughs> I'm not good at that. So I don't want to leave anybody in the waiting room. Um, anyway, just that one of the reasons why I like it. Of course, the blooms in the spring are great for pollinator, or excuse me, um, this is actually more of a summer bloom, I would say. Mine come in June. I know some folks, depending on their position, they bloom in July. But anyway, bees love them. Um, they're covered in bees um, when they're blooming. Uh, and again, you kind of get that double whammy of fall color. So just something to think about. Um, I like this. Our uh, extension officer, Nicole, uh, said that her grandmother in Georgia calls this plant Granny Graybeard. I don't know if anybody on the um, webinar has other names for it. I've always known it as fringe tree, but I like Granny Graybeard a lot better. <laughs> I think that's an awesome common name. I bet that's the one my mother-in-law uses. But anyway, um, I know it as fringe tree. And uh, this is a great small tree. It's an absolutely great replacement for um, the pear trees. Um, it, because it, um, Bradford pears because you know those are incredibly invasive and this blooms at about the same time and has the same white blooms but um, it's a native tree it's tough um, it'll stay relatively small it also grows under black walnuts you can tell i'm very scarred by the whole black walnut experience um, but it's also tolerant of that uh, so it's just great and i, I know um, it's listed as fragrant. I've seen several sources that have said it's fragrant. I don't know if anybody on the um, webinar has one in their yard that's fragrant. I haven't noticed a lot of fragrance, but um, if anybody has had a different experience, please shout it out. Um, but John Bannister collected this plant during his 1678 uh, plant hunting trip. Uh, that was the gentleman that came over for King Charles II. Um, and so uh, it's clearly been in cultivation a long time and even in uh, England in cultivation for a long time. He called it old man's beard, which is maybe where it got to gray beard, gray, granny's gray beard or whatever it was that Nicole's uh, mom calls it. Um, Thomas Jefferson also, he wrote to John Bartram. I thought this was kind of interesting. So when Jefferson was, uh, ambassador to France, he wrote to John Bartram Jr., the uh, gentleman in Philadelphia that had the nursery, in 1786 and asked him to send him seeds of fringe tree to share with his Parisian friends. So uh, apparently this tree was very haute couture and wanted by folks in Paris uh, in 1786. So um, it's just a good, good tree, small tree. Uh, next up, Magnolia virginiana, sweet bay. So uh, I didn't realize that this one was uh, named after Virginia as well, but it's a great, another great small tree, um, does really well in wet soil. So if you have a soggy spot, uh, it's kind of a good idea for that. Um, it's a lot smaller than, you know, your traditional magnolias. So uh, instead of you know, the great big southern magnolias that kind of take over the nice brick rancher behind them. <laughs> um, this one's going to stay 35 feet or smaller. Um, and th these flowers, I have definitely noticed a scent, like a real lemony um, kind of scent. So just something to think about, nice evergreen, if you're looking for an evergreen. Uh, next up, uh, witch hazel. Uh, there are several different types of witch hazel, so you would have to, if you go to a nursery or you're shopping for one of these, you just have to be careful that the specific epithet is Virginiana. Um, not that the other witch hazels are not nice witch hazels. Uh, <laughs> there's one that's native to Arkansas. It's very nice. 
Um, but if you were looking specifically for a Virginia named plant, just, you know, just check the specific epithet uh, to make sure you know what you're getting. But anyway, um, this one, I think one of its outstanding qualities is it's blooming so late in the fall. Uh, you Several times I've been able to kind of cut branches and bring them in for a Thanksgiving uh, bouquets, you know, maybe your centerpiece at Thanksgiving, and they're just, there's not a lot of things that are blooming at that time of year, so it's, it's kind of neat, um, and it's also fragrant. It kind of has a, an herby fragrance. I wouldn't, I guess fragrance is all unique to individuals. Maybe other folks have had experience, um, but shout that out, whatever you think it smells like, but I, th I think it's kind of a neat smell. Um, and again, it's fine with clay soil and deer will avoid it. So what's not to like? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, and also sometimes with witch hazel, I saw a really interesting example. Someone had limbed a witch hazel up and they had made a witch hazel into like a small understory tree. I thought that was a really interesting use of a witch hazel. Uh, so just something to think about. Uh, next up, um, persimmon. I think persimmon is so interesting. I did not realize uh, until a couple of years ago, I was writing an article about persimmon. It's actually a word from the Powhatan um, nation's language. So uh, persimmon is uh, a Native American term uh, from the Powhatan nation. So, I mean, how much more local can you get from that, right? I mean, we're the Goochland Powhatan master gardeners and, and here's a tree named in the Powhatan language. Um, so persimmon trees, um, I think are a great fruit tree. They kind of take care of themselves. You do not need to spray them. So um, I'm, as I've become more and more committed to sustainable practices, I've had a hard time growing fruit trees <laughs> because unfortunately um, a lot of uh, fruit tree care uh, can include spraying. And so I've, I've kind of stepped back um, from growing fruit, uh, but persimmons, native fruit tree, absolutely no need to spray. Um, you do, I would definitely recommend waiting until after frost to uh, harvest because they, they can be very tangy <laughs> if they have not gone through uh, a frost, but great tree um, and great fruit and yummy. Um, I mean, one of the only reasons that they aren't more common in grocery stores is they don't travel well. So, you know, our commercial grade fruit needs to travel a long way, it needs to be put in bins, it needs to be handled kind of roughly, that type of thing. And so persimmons need, uh, can't really travel hours and hours by 18 wheeler, that's not their superpower. Uh, they're kind of a tender skin. So uh, it's great to grow them locally on your own property because you get access to them and, and they're hard to find in grocery stores. So, all right, I'm done selling the persimmon. <laughs> um, oh, one, I do want to just give you a heads up. Um, they are typically dioecious. Um, dioecious, see, I'm not good with Latin words. Um, th there are female and male um, trees. So typically, if you want to get a really good fruit set, you do want to have probably two or three or four on your property, but you can kind of put them at the back. They'll take care of themselves. Um, and you just improve your odds of a really good fruit set if you have multiples. Although there are some self-fertile varieties um, and I know edible landscapes up in Afton could probably direct you if you're looking for a self-fertile. Like if you can only plant one, um, you might wanna talk to them and they could get you the right variety. All right, um, next up, um, Eastern Red Cedar. I love Eastern Red Cedars. And sometimes <laughs> they don't get a lot of love in Virginia. I think people view them as kind of the trees that grow along fence lines, um, scrub trees, you know, that type of thing. But they're actually a really great evergreen. And they are 
such a good support for the ecosystem. If you look, Eastern red cedar berries, they're not actually berries, they're um, cones, but I'm gonna call them berries because they look like berries to me, um, are such a great support for birds. If you ever want a flock of uh, cedar wax wings to come to your yard, uh, Eastern red cedars are great for that. Uh, they're just beautiful. Um, and they're black walnut tolerant. Do you sense a theme? Anyway, um, so I find them stunning and beautiful. Deer won't bother them. And they're named after Virginia. And they were used as an ornamental in colonial gardens. There's evidence as early as 1736 of colonialists going and uh, transplanting Eastern red cedars into their ornamental gardens. So they've been loved for a long time. All right, next up, uh, I did not take this photo. This is from the Missouri Botanical Garden, um, but I love this plant. I have, I'm testing out four different varieties in my garden right now, uh, as well as the straight species, because I just love it. Uh, Culver's root, it's not the most elegant common name. So we'll go with Veronicastrum virginica. <laughs> um, and it creates these candelabra flowers. And I've never had a problem. I don't. I don't stake, I don't baby plants in my garden. Um, if you can't survive on your own, you need to be in someone else's garden. <laughs> and so these are very tall plants. You can put them in the back or most of the varieties are tall. There's some shorter. Um, you don't have to stake them or at least I never have had to stake them. I don't have very, you know, I try and keep my soil somewhat lean. So I've never had an issue with staking them and they're gorgeous. And when they're in bloom, they must have a very high um, nutritional value because they are covered in bees uh, when they're in bloom and they can come in uh, the species straight species is I would say white but they have some light lilac some pink several different um, varieties now that you can typically get in in most garden centers um, so it's a fun plant if anyone has a a uh, Culver's root variety that they especially like, please mention it <laughs> in the chat box or at the end of the talk, because I'm always looking for another, another one to grow. Um, so if anybody has a favorite, please let me know. Anyway, they are also, there's, they're known to have been grown in colonial gardens at least as early as 1736. So um, folks in Virginia have known a good thing for a long time. Uh, this might be my last plant. I think it is. Yep, this is the last one. Um, I do not grow this one. So if anybody on the call has some experience that they want to share, uh, I would be very open to learning more. Um, but it's named, it's the only plant that was named, this, this genus is the only genus that was named after John Tredeskin. So who was the original plant hunter in the 1640s. Um, so I definitely wanted to include it, even though I don't grow it. Um, more commonly known as spiderwort. Uh, my understanding is this one's a real winner as far as the bloom power to upkeep ratio, you know, very little upkeep for a lot of bloom power. Um, so if that's not true, then, you know, please correct me. <laughs> uh, but that's the story on the street is that this one's easy to care for and gives you a lot of blooms. Um, and it doesn't mind acidic soils. So that's great for Virginia, clearly. Um, and medium to wet. So I don't, I don't know if that, if it really likes a bog or if it just wants to stay, you know, kind of damp like a phlox. But anyway, I think it's beautiful and it's named after John Tredeskant as well as the state of Virginia. So I figure that's a winner. All right, so I think I'll take a um, pause. Here. I don't know if there's any comments or questions. Anybody grow spider wart and wants to share? No comments. Hi. Um, I just said something. <laughs> Hi, this is Kate. Um, we grow it at the Powhatan Historic Garden. It's 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 oh growing in our garden. And it we don't have any bogs there, so it must uh, you know, our our uh, beds are are pretty friable. They're not um, we do water throughout the, the, the summer months, okay. but 
and it does reseed. So it'll pop up in other beds. So it's, right. it's, it's really, a, I mean, very easy to take care of. And I really like this plant. Uh, yeah, I um, like volunteers. I call those free plants. <laughs> um, uh, this is Laura. Um, in, I have friends in Richmond that consider this a weed and pull it oh. out of their, their garden. Um, I have it growing in a, a native plant pollinator garden, and I really like it. It 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 was uh, um, bloomed from May to August. It, it was it was very um, very busy with bees. Okay, so I was I, real happy with it. But uh, friends of mine who live in the city are like, "Oh, it's a weed." So <laughs> I guess. Well, it, you I appreciate know, you verifying the bloom period because when I yeah. saw that, I was like. That's a really, you know, is that yeah. an overstatement? But you really had multiple. Yes. Okay. And it was a second year plant. I have some in a, a full sun area. And I noticed yesterday that there's still some blooms on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, but okay. Well, know, this is an odd year, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then I'm definitely keeping this in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a winner, right? Okay. Um, well, this is the end and we're at 11 o'clock, 11.01. So I'm actually a minute over. I apologize. Uh, but basically the whole point of the presentation is just to kind of appreciate Virginia botanical history. It's really rich and deep and broad. And um, it's an amazing thing about our state. Um, and it's just kind of fun to know. Um, and, you know, it's just a different way to look at native plants. I think sometimes, you know, like apparently spider wart in the city of Richmond, <laughs> um, sometimes people, you know, look at native plants and they kind of, oh, poo-poo them because they're local. But if you think about it, here were kings and dukes and earls and bishops in England who were desperate for Virginia native plants. And they're still... 50% of National Trust gardens uh, in England. So I just hope that we value our native plants just a little more and just look at them kind of differently, that they are, they're gorgeous, highly valued plants. And uh, I hope we show them a little love. So <laughs> that's kind of the point of the presentation. I really appreciate everybody coming today. Thank you. Kathy, thank you very much for your uh, informative presentation. The history part I thought was fascinating as well as the examples. Um, and we're grateful to you for your time and the effort that you put into this to share your expertise with us. And a couple of things in case people are forming some questions. Um, I'd just like to let you know, Kathy mentioned that there is a handout. You can go to the library website and um, go to the calendar. Or also, um, if you wanted to view part of it again, or you know someone that couldn't make it this morning, there will be a recording of this through our website. You can uh, click on the adults icon or go a little lower on the screen to the YouTube channel. You can also get the link to the handout there. So. Um, and I'd like to let you know that Kathy will be back with us in January to talk about ornamental pollinator gardens. Uh, that date is on Saturday, January 14th. It'll be at 10 a.m. and it is a virtual event. Um, the registration should be opening soon for that. So any other questions or comments? I just wanna make a comment that uh, in March, at the library, we'll be having a, a joint event with the library uh, that is a soil event. Um, oh, yeah. There'll be a brief presentation and then uh, some demonstrations of various elements of soil, including composting and hugel culture and other, lots of other things, cover crops, et cetera. So I hope folks will join us for that. And that's in person. Thank you very much for mentioning that, Audrey. So, Kathy, we've gotten some comments of other of participants that are thanking you for the um, presentation. So, thank you so much yeah, for coming. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks so much to all of our participants for joining us today and keeping the discussion going. And we will see you on January 14th.
Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.